Let's talk about Robert Solomon's views on business ethics. He builds it around an Aristotelian conception, meaning basically an ethics of virtue. Good employees, he says, are good people. Solomon talks about a division between three kinds of virtues that are important in business. One of them is moral virtue. Much of traditional moral virtue ethics comes down to elaborating certain moral virtues. Things like generosity, kindness, and so on. But they blend, as those examples indicate, into a second set. Ones that Aristotle stresses, and that most modern moral philosophers don't really think about a whole lot. He calls those the social virtues. Things like wit, being fun to be around, being friendly. Those are things that Aristotle talks about as important dimensions of a good life. We often don't think about being witty or being friendly as particularly moral virtues, but Aristotle did think of them as an important category of what it is to live well. And so here we might think of these as the strictly moral virtues by a more modern conception. Here are the social virtues, the virtues of getting along with people, what's sometimes been called social intelligence. Those are important virtues in business. You've got to get along with people. And then lastly, there's a set of virtues that Solomon calls the military virtues. Those include virtues we associate with leadership. So courage is one of those. Being decisive is one of those. And being able to resolve conflicts. Solomon says maybe the most important of these is what he calls toughness. That is to say, the ability to face hard facts, to face hard decisions, and to make decisions in the face of these kinds of conflicts, exercising practical wisdom, and having the courage to take a stand and say, look, I know there are downsides to resolving the conflict this way. Nevertheless, I think this is what we have to do. The person who faces a financial crunch, for example, for the company, by deciding they have to sell off that product line, or they have to close that factory, or they have to lay off workers. That's a hard decision to make. Nobody likes making such decisions, but the person who is tough is the person who can make them and make them wisely. The person who is tough is the person who can recognize that that's the thing to do despite the disadvantages, despite the harms and the downsides, because the other ways of proceeding also have downsides. And so the person with toughness is the person who recognizes and is willing to make trade-offs of this kind in full recognition of what's being sacrificed for another good being obtained. That, Solomon says, if anything, is the central business virtue. After all, getting along with people and being moral, those are important in almost every aspect of life. And so those are things that are going to apply to many of the roles you play outside of business as well. But these military virtues, virtues of leadership, of toughness, of making hard decisions, of having the courage to make difficult decisions and stand by them, those, he thinks, are really distinctive to business. So insofar as we think about business ethics, we definitely don't want to forget the moral virtues and the social virtues. In fact, we want to stress those because they're often forgotten by moral philosophers. But we're also going to place special emphasis on these military virtues of courage, of leadership, of toughness, because those are ones that we might not have to exercise in other aspects of our lives. There is no complete separation between the virtues that are important in business and the virtues that are important in life. Business is part of life. And indeed, one shouldn't have a completely different persona in business than one has in the rest of life. But there can be something misleading about that. Almost everybody is surprised when they see a family member, for example, interacting with other people in a business context. It's very different, typically, from people's interactions one-on-one -on -one with members of their own family or with friends. And so there are differences in roles, and that's an important part of Solomon's theory, too. We shape our own conception of ourselves in part by the roles we play in society. And those roles come along with certain conceptions of virtues. They come along with duties and obligations as well as privileges. And we have to, in order to fulfill them well, understand what those obligations are, what those duties are, what those privileges are, and what virtues are relevant to them. 
It's important to keep in mind here the Aristotelian conception of virtue as excellence. Indeed, Solomon elaborated these ideas in a book, Ethics and Excellence, up there, <laughs> Cooperation and Integrity in Business. And it's important to keep in mind that for Solomon, as well as for Aristotle, virtue is not just a matter of keeping within the bounds of obeying certain rules. It's a matter of excellence. It's a matter of excelling at living <laughs> in the broadest sense, but also then in particular, fulfilling various roles in a business context. When you join an organization, you are agreeing to occupy a certain role and thereby take on those responsibilities, those duties that are associated with the role. Along with that, in addition, are certain criteria of excellence. And you're agreeing to pursue excellence according to those criteria. Now, it's important that all of these obligations, that all of these duties, that those responsibilities are to be understood as prima facie or pro tanto. And by that, I mean they hold all other things being equal. They are contributory. They are not necessarily things that take precedence over other things. And indeed, Solomon says that business ethics starts when we find ourselves in situations of conflict. Conflicts among the demands of various roles we play, or sometimes conflicts that arise within a certain role we play. Often, the judgments we have to make in a given business context are ones that already come with multiple criteria, multiple lines of responsibility, and we can easily find ourselves in situations of conflict, just involving things on the job. Then when we think about reconciling our duties on the job to our duties in the rest of life, we realize there are additional sources of conflict there. So it's important to recognize that we might go along trying to just do a good job, and at first glance you might think there's nothing more to business ethics than that. Do a good job. But conflicts can arise, and he says it's then when we feel the need to really face ethical questions directly. We can't just sweep them in the background. We've got to recognize, wait a minute, I've got responsibilities here, but also responsibilities there. That immediately forces us to confront the question of which responsibilities take precedence. Solomon tells us that business ethics begins, for most of us, in some conflict of roles within an organization, implementing policies or decisions not of our own making, and often against our better judgment. I think he's making a good point here, which is that often in business you find yourself faced with a conflict of roles, not only multiple responsibilities that you have. It might be as simple as being involved in several projects, deadlines are approaching, you have to make choices about where to spend your energy and where to devote your time. That's complicated and sometimes there are real conflicts of that simple kind. But all too often people in business do find themselves implementing policies they don't really agree with. And that can be tricky. In fact, sometimes I think the art of management consists in figuring out how to fulfill your responsibilities in a way that is compatible with the kinds of directives you get from above, but often not exactly following them, finding your way around the rules, not so much implementing the rules. Now, I realize that's a rather cynical attitude and one that in certain contexts can get you into trouble. If those rules are laws, I do not recommend trying to skirt the law instead of actually facing it and fulfilling the law. But there are times when directives that might make sense even from the point of view of the entire corporation don't make sense with respect to your particular role or your part of the company. And then you have to decide what to do. Well, those are the kinds of things that affect almost everybody in business at one point or another. You find that the policies you're given don't make any sense. Maybe you simply disagree with them. Maybe you even think they're immoral. But often it's not so much a question of disagreeing or finding them immoral, but simply finding them unhelpful, finding them an obstacle to doing your job. There are times where you have to say, well, look, <laughs> I can't fulfill all of the expectations here. I cannot do this and do that and do what I view as the main part of my job and fulfill all of these additional expectations. So what do I do? 
I have to pick and choose. I have to say, well, first of all, I have to keep my eye on the ball and figure out what is most important here. What is my main responsibility? And then I figure out which of the additional ones I can integrate in with that to make an effective package. But almost inevitably, something has to be left by the wayside. It's not to say that that responsibility is utterly evaded or that rule is broken, but it may be that, look, I pay lip service to this one. I really work on fulfilling that one and that one. And often in business, you find yourself in that situation. Expectations are placed that are utterly unfulfillable when taken together. And there are hard choices then that have to be made. Look, I simply can't do A, B, C, and D all together. Which is really important. A and B, B and C. You have to make decisions like that and figure out how to deal with such situations. Now, this is not always because the expectations are unreasonable, though sometimes they are. It can simply be that because of circumstances, because of conditions, because, hey, look, our working group is down three people and there are only two of us left and there's only so much we can do. It's not that those were unreasonable expectations when we had five working on this. Now that we have two, we've got to cut some corners. What do we do? And those kinds of problems occur all the time. That brings us to one of Solomon's central points. Business ethics should be useful to people in business. Too often, approaches to business ethics don't really fulfill that expectation. They base something on a moral theory, let's say. And that's fine. It's okay to have a moral theory and to reflect in general on what it is to be a good person, what it is to lead a good life, how one ought to go about making decisions in general. All of those things, I think, are relevant to business ethics. But he points out that they aren't by themselves sufficient because it is in fulfilling a specific role that we encounter a lot of these conflicts. And no theory, whether it's Kantian deontology or some consequentialist theory, or even a theory of virtue ethics in a general sense like Aristotle's, is going to tell us how to resolve those conflicts. We might think, well, we should resolve the conflicts for the greater good, or as a virtuous person would resolve them, or in a way that we could generalize and that any rational being facing such a conflict could adopt as a resolution. But that by itself doesn't tell us what to do. So we really need to get down to the nitty gritty, to try to develop a concept of business ethics that will help people in business actually face these conflicts. Now I'm going to be talking much more about moral conflicts because I think he's on to a very important point here. And it is true that traditional moral theories have shockingly little to say about how to resolve conflicts. In fact, the only theory that really confronts the issue very directly uh, is consequentialism. And indeed, Jeremy Bentham takes that as one of the arguments in favor of consequentialism. He says a moral theory ought to be useful. It ought to help you resolve conflicts. Most conflicts we encounter in ordinary life, we resolve pretty quickly and pretty easily. Bentham says, how do we do it? We think about the effects and we try to go with the one that causes the least damage or produces the most good, hence consequentialism. But you might not think that's really how we do it, or at least that's not the main way we do it. At any rate, it's one of a whole arsenal of tools we use for resolving conflicts. And if you think that way, you're going to think that we need a theory more complex than that, one more tailored to the specific roles that people play. Now, let me mention a possible objection to Solomon's general line of inquiry, but then also a possible response. The objection is that he's not so much giving us an Aristotelian ethics of virtue as a role ethics. He's saying really, in the end, it comes down to the virtues associated with your role, what it is to excel in fulfilling that role as an accountant or an auditor or a project manager or whatever it happens to be. And there is a certain point to that. You might say he's giving us a role ethics, but without a theory of roles. He's giving us something like relationship regulation theory, but without the underlying relational models theory that tells us what the models we have available to understand various roles are. And so if you think, well, it all depends on your role, and you think, well, okay, here is my particular role, just what are my responsibilities? How do I go about resolving conflicts in that role? 
you might think Solomon has nothing useful to say. And so, without an underlying theory of social roles, you might think an ethics of social roles doesn't help you very much. Anyway, that's the objection. I think, however, there is a potential reply, and it's a reply akin to the reply he gives to the person who approaches business ethics from the point of view of a general moral theory like consequentialism or Kantianism or virtue ethics in the broader sense, which is to say, wait, it's too general. It doesn't help me resolve these particular conflicts. You might think the same is true even if we have a theory of relational models like that that Fisk and Rye and others supply for us, so we could say, well, great, communal sharing, authority ranking, equality matching, and market pricing. There we have four general models. But still, look at the corporation. We have, even within the finance and accounting area, people who are accountants, people who are specifically working on taxes, people who are auditing, other people who are operating as financial advisors, some who are simply financial analysts, and so on. All of those are very different roles. Now, yes, there are authority relationships, so we need to think about authority ranking aspects of this. There are co-workers. We need to think about communal sharing and equality matching aspects of this. All of this is, after all, a business, and we're talking about money here as a measure, and we're concerned with proportionality. So, of course, market pricing relationships are going to be relevant here. But still, all of those things are different. The role of an auditor is different from that of a tax accountant or a financial advisor. And so we need to be able to talk about the specifics. From that point of view, you might say it's not a surprise that Solomon isn't giving us an extensive theory of relationship models on which he builds this role ethics. It really depends on the corporation. In fact, the role of a financial analyst in one division of one company might be very different from the role of a financial analyst in another division of even the same company, let alone another company and a government agency, and a private consulting firm, and so on. And so I think his point is we really have to tailor this to the specific roles involved in doing that particular job. We can maybe generalize and so talk about accounting ethics, for example, or the ethics of law, but those are generalizations that will also be of limited help. It will matter whether you are fulfilling this particular role or that particular role, even in the same company, let alone across different companies and different kinds of